David. <laughs> David, you're muted. <laughs> Hi, Suzanne. Good evening. There you go. Good evening. It's it's such it's so nice to see you. Wonderful to see you this evening. How this random so to 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 see you in this way over Zoom just on a Thursday. We just happen to be on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> I just like to keep my room open if anybody wants to stop by. We can be spontaneous about it. But in reality, this is a music talk and tea. I have mine ready to go here. My sister gave me this mug, which I love. And tonight we're going to celebrate music and friendship and contemplate the role that friendship has had in the long history of, of musical composition. Not only the friendship between David Fulmer and Jacob Greenberg, but the imaginary friendship between Jacob Greenberg, David Fulmer and Schubert. Why not? Because both of them have communed with Schubert in the release of the latest CD, um, designed and and you know artistically planned by Jacob Greenberg, where he's going to share some excerpts of the recent Schubert recordings he's made, along with the commission for a new work from David Fulmer. It is my great pleasure to start off by introducing David. David is uh, luckily my colleague at Hunter College. We are very very fortunate to have him. If there's a prize in composition to be won, David has won it. He's had a Guggenheim Fellowship. He's had a Kuzovitsky Award. He uh, won a Charles Ives Fellowship. He is a member of the Academy for Arts and Letters. He has been commissioned by almost every major uh, music organization around the world. He got his training at Juilliard. He is a conductor, a violinist, and a composer, and a wonderful human being, which is a rare quartet of qualities. Correct, David? <laughs> you don't have to say yes. <laughs> and it's all true. Anyway, it's my pleasure to welcome you, David, uh, to Music Talks and Tea, uh, Chain by Chain, a celebration of your recent work with Jacob Greenberg. Suzanne, thank you so much. Uh, welcome, folks. It is such a great pleasure and honor to be here in front of you this evening for a presentation which is uh, a partial concert as well as a discussion and a Q and A as well. Um, during music talks and tea, uh, it has been uh, such a joy to see the different types of musical fabrics uh, that have been discussed over over the previous months and and over this past year. And this evening happens to be uh, devoted to just as uh, Suzanne had uh, suggested to music and friendship. And tonight, uh, I'd like to present a new work of mine. Uh, by the title of Chain by Chain. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about it after we listen to it, and I would like to welcome our special guest artist, Jacob Greenberg. So if you will, I'd love to start with this concert presentation with a recording. Thank you. 
The selection you just heard was a recent piano work of mine entitled Chain by Chain, performed by Jacob Greenberg. And this evening in Music Talks and Tea, this is a celebration of a recent release. And uh, it is such an enormous joy uh, to bring in uh, Jacob Greenberg. Uh, Jacob, welcome. Uh, pianist Jacob Greenberg's work as a soloist and chamber musician has received worldwide acclaim. As a longtime member of the International Contemporary Ensemble, he has performed throughout the Americas and Europe. His solo concert series, Music at Close Range, shows his equal commitment to classics of the repertoire. A leading pianist of modern song, he has toured extensively with soprano Tony Arnold. Their 2013 recording of Olivier Messiaen's Harawi has been singled out by critics. Other ensemble performances include Music Now with members of the Chicago Symphony and Contempo at the University of Chicago. As an orchestral player, he has also appeared with the New York Philharmonic, Israel Philharmonic, and Australian Chamber Orchestra. Mr. Greenberg is on the faculty of Tanglewood Music Faculty and has taught at Hunter College, the City University of New York. Uh, Jacob, welcome. It is such a great joy to have you here this evening and to talk about not only Chain by Chain, but Schubert and our collaboration and the entire package of, of what this entails. Um, so welcome to Music Tease and Talk. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to Hunter College to give me a chance to celebrate your work and th this new recording as a whole. Thanks very much. Jacob, when I first remember the, the, the first few days of talking about this project, I remember we had a, a, a very lengthy conversation about the type of sonorities that would perhaps be contained in this work, uh, the types of structure, the type of uh, form that I might explore. And uh, Jacob and I have been uh, longtime uh, friends and longtime musical companions, uh, whether it be in chamber ensembles or larger orchestral ones. Uh, and so the idea, the concept of Schubert was so enticing to me. And I know that that is a point of departure for this piece, but it's also a point of arrival with regard to the general architecture of this disc. And um, I'm wondering if, if you would be so kind as to share some of uh, the intricate details of, of your organization and your relationship with Schubert. Well, a, a love of Schubert is something that I, I know you and I have in common and we've loved Schubert for years and he's been central to our performance practice. Um, I, I think I, I didn't really get Schubert personally uh, until I was in high school. I um, was lucky to, uh, to hear an amazing performance at McCarter Theatre in Princeton by, by Richard Good, uh, whom I idolized. I think this was 1991. And uh, it was then that I was, I was really awakened to Schubert's depth and, and also his daring. And I, I hadn't heard any of the big Schubert works before. I, I'd only heard small pieces and I'd played some of the piano impromptus, but I, I was attracted to, um, to the A major sonata, which is a, a central piece on this new disc uh, for, for many reasons. And th that was my, my point of entry, I think, in, into this entire project. It, it's so warming to hear that we can look back and grab a morsel of the repertoire and bring it forward. And I know you and I have had such endless conversations about how Schubert has uh, become a, a central figure specifically for you and I, uh, certainly. And we both uh, have performed a, a lot of Schubert repertoire, whether it's, it's the solo piano works, whether it's the violin works, the chamber music and, and symphonic literature. Um, and this project lies in, I think, all of the thread work that sews up all of these relationships, you know? Um, and I've had a longstanding relationship with Schubert as an instrumentalist, as well as a conductor, um, having played the sonatinas and, and much of the violin repertoire, uh, a, most of the chamber works, the string quartets, of course, the famous cello quintet, um, and, and, and much more than that. And now conducting, some of my favorite works, uh, the Fifth Symphony, the Seventh Symphony, the Eighth, uh, among many others, yes? And so 
um, I came to this project with two major figures on my shoulders. One was Schubert and the other was Jacob Greenberg. And so I had to finesse and find a path forward into how I could create a new work that in many ways is an abstract expression of my relationship with this music. Uh, and I, I think to some degree, uh, Jacob, you and I have, have both discussed the fact that Schubert has not necessarily been in the limelight, so to speak, as a new music influencer in many ways, uh, perhaps uh, much less so than Beethoven or Bach or Mozart, whereby um, certain anniversaries and centenaries and, and so forth, certain celebrations of these, of these classic masters have spawned the genesis of new works. And our project, the genesis began speaking about your work with Schubert. It, it began about speaking about my work with Schubert and what this piece would sound like. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I wanted to come tonight and bring some spontaneity to our presentation. And so I simply wrote down, as I would if I heard a new work uh, uh, of anyone's. Yes, I wrote down some notes about my piece. Um, which might sound a little bizarre to our audience, but I'm always looking to learn about the curvature of my architecture, about the form, about all of the ingredients that, that make the aggregate of sound. It's, sound is so important to me as a composer. It's so important to me as a conductor. It's, it's, it's sound management. And, and I like uh, the fact that I'm able to control sound with my tools, whether it's with a pencil uh, or a baton in hand. Um, Jacob, I would love to continue listening because I know that tonight we are focusing on uh, a concert presentation to celebrate this disc and the release, the recent release of this disc. Would you uh, please introduce our next work as I cue it up? Sure. Let's play a little of the Lendler. This is from a set of 12 Lend Lendler uh, German folk dances. I think we'll hear two of them. I wanted to include this set of dances on the disc because, because I think it's incredibly innovative and also because we don't often have a chance to hear the really mature Schubert in miniature, in miniature forms. And these dances, in my opinion, ha have all the, hallmark, the hallmarks of, of his great music, uh, unexpected turns of phrase and totally surprising harmonic shifts, for instance, and also a, a really startling intimacy. And I, I hope you'll have the same impression listening to these. Terrific. Let's have a listen.
bravo, bravo, bravo. I, I can't help. I, I trying not to be distracted. I'm, I tried my best not to move my hands and not to move my body <laughs> in this performance. Uh, Jacob, you, your interpretations are so fluid. I actually took notes on some Schubert. And the first word I wrote down was movement. And your sense of line and trajectory in these performances is, is so inspiring. As a composer, now I'm speaking um, away as a conductor and more now as the composer. Um, that sense of architecture that you bring is, is so fluid and uninterrupted. What you're, specifically you're, you're attracted to too kind of about this work? <laughs> uh, well, you know, get, getting uh, what, back to the, what specific about this work? Getting back to the question of modernism, uh, I, I think the Schubert pieces that stick out to me most are, are, are those that I, where I, I, I hear that quality and I'll, I'll attempt to define it. The, um, we talked about this in, in our early discussions of your commission and, and also about Schubert more generally, that he, he's not embraced as a modernist the way that some of his other contemporaries are, namely Beethoven and, and Schumann. And uh, I, I do hear him and, and feel him as a distinctive and as a daring figure within the style that he embraced. And I'm curious about your thoughts on this too. What I say to people is that Schubert wasn't a modernist every day of the week, uh, but he is a composer of very extreme contrasts. And the, the intimacy of the writing is, is always daring. It, it, it's unsurpassed in that sense. He experiments constantly in many areas, uh, being spontaneous, not just with melody, but with instrumental texture, with dynamics, lots of extreme dynamics, triple fortes, triple pianos, uh, with form and above all with harmony. The, the surface of the music I feel um, has mostly soft edges, not, not always, but mostly, which I think uh, are, are a kind of cover for hard ideas, if you will, <laughs> um, uncompromised ideas. And that to me, is a, a very modern kind of duality and very interesting. And I think those ideas have to do with character and, and with a, a really urgent intention. And that disjunct between the surface and, and what's underneath really speaks to my modernist side. Uh, I, I hear it in this set of Lendler, I hear it uh, writ large in the Sonata and uh, just sensing something that's bubbling under the surface, which is so stubbornly driven, uh, even in the gentlest music. That, that's a, a, a very modern aesthetic to me. I love those descriptions, and I've wrote many of them down uh, just so I can reflect about those. I think the element of intimacy is is so much on the immediate surface of the music. And when I, and, uh, for those composers who are tuning in tonight, um, by surface, I mean form, structure, dynamic, and pitch relationship. And so that certainly has always been of interest to me because I, I think he was daring. I'm going to use your word. It was extremely daring. And I might even say courageously so uh, because there is, is movement in such obtuse directions. And for me, uh, whether they we're referencing the songs or the amazing repertoire for piano or the symphonic lit uh, uh, or the chamber music, you know, I, I can't help but bring back the cello quintet into focus and thinking that it took Schubert one hour to drop a semitonic relationship, right? I mean, it's, it's just amazing. That modernity is so fascinating to me. And, and I think as we as interpreters now on stage, as we're bringing this music to new heights of interpretation and, and, and design, design and architecture, I think these are the things that are under that immediate surface. And that, you know, much like any composition is, like an onion, you sort of just simply keep peeling these layers upon layers. And the deeper you get, you realize that the, the densities and, and, and the textures are so complex. And, you know, we usually think of uh, uh, Schubert and Beethoven uh, uh, similarly, 
as using rather limited tessitoras in terms of thematic presentations. For Beethoven, it was always about five, right? It, every single theme. It revolved around scales degree one, two, three, four, and five. Schubert, a little more florid. Uh, there are more jumps and there's, there are more leaps. Uh, even still, what is amazing about this literature is that I can sing it all. Uh, I'm, 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 I am no vocalist, but when I hear your performance, I literally, and I think some of you saw that, I was swaying from side to side. And, and I think there's, there's a lot to do uh, with the general affect of structure and form. And I, I know that these two words are, are inextricably tied, but they're also um, theoretical terms. And, and I don't want to talk too much about the, the theoretical component because we are speaking as performers who are also theorists, who are also musical, excuse me, musicologists uh, and so on. So um, I'm so glad to hear that for you, the Schubert surface is daring because for me it is, it's courageous. And as I was developing my work for you, I think those were certainly um, elements of the composition or the approach that I wanted to delve into further and courageous in terms of extending fluid form and daring in terms of the registral capacities and formulations of, of a given work. Um, and most of all, uh, this piece, I think is, is, one, is one single line. I, those are the notes I took uh, uh, about your performance. Um, and so I, I love re-examining and throwing the Schubert under a microscope and we can look at it at 3x, 4x, 10x, 20x and understand the, the, the conceptual properties of interpretation. You know, that, that You've had this long-standing yeah. relationship with Schubert for so long. And I remember yeah. when we first started collaborating 10, 15 years ago, even longer than that, um, Schubert was always on the front burner for you. Can you tell me and tell us about all of the journeys that you've taken with this composer? Well, um, maybe I can speak a little bit about the title of this disc, which might get us into, into those themes. The, the, the disc is called Schubert Spinning Chains. And that, that's an extension of the title of your piece, David, Chain by Chain. And it, it also alludes to other aspects of, of his life and his work. And a, a composer's story is, is always uh, a, a primary contact for, for me and, and, and music. I, I need to know something about the composer, where, where he lived, how he lived, uh, where he went for coffee, <laughs> um, who his friends were, wh what social circles he was a part of. And that's a, a big part of Schubert's life. The, uh, the A major sonata, which is the big piece in the disc, was written during this completely astonishing period at the very end of Schubert's life. And, and remember, Schubert was only 31 when he died. He should have been in the prime of his life, uh, but it, it was cut short so tragically. And the last three piano sonatas were, were written in just blindingly quick succession, essentially all in one month. This was September of 1828, and uh, Schubert died in November of that year. And even though he was working from sketches that he had made earlier in the year, it, it's it, it's amazing that he was able to work with that speed, uh, even just to write the notes down. It, it's likely uh, that Schubert contracted syphilis as as early as five years earlier in 1823, uh, the year that he wrote the set of the Landler. But the the really devastating illness. Uh, took effect within his last year. He, he, he was living in Vienna at his brother's home in self-enforced solitude and away from his, uh, his circle of, of, of sophisticated Viennese friends. So he, he was in isolation, but in, in this fevered creative state, and it's, that's a particular kind of bondage that, that I can only imagine to, to be so amazingly productive just turning out one masterpiece after the next in, in those conditions, it's really a, a high watermark of musical creativity 
in history and, and, and also of heroism. And the qualities of the, the A major sonata, uh, maybe more than the others of the last three, that appeal to me uh, really were uh, about this theme, about heroism as a subject and, and the shapes that that takes as extroverted and as introverted expressions. So in, in that sense, uh, going back to the, the disc title, Schubert's Spinning Chains, he's, he's making light of his bondage in a way, as, as I conceive it at least, with, with strength and with humor, uh, spinning the chains that bind him. And also, uh, I, I feel this music is very timely. Uh, thinking about isolation and, and also illness for me really locates the music squarely in the middle of this pandemic. It, it, it's had very deep resonance for me this year. Have, have you also experienced that? Yes, uh, I have. And, and I share those exact sentiments uh, with you. I think this music uh, touches a, a piece of the soul and a piece of the heart that perhaps is particularly sensitive at this time. Uh, and the, the concept of, of isolation and of healing together as musicians. I, I, I couldn't think of a better alternative than for us to be in collaboration. And I know that a lot of uh, tonight's presentation has to do with music and friends. And inside of that is the main theme of collaboration. Um, and I adore looking through your lens at these pieces uh, because we see the theoretics and we see the historical perspective shine brightly through your interpretation. And at this time, I would like to play some more Schubert. Great. Uh, shall we do the second movement? We shall. Okay. Just a little bit. David, I wanted to circle back to your piece now that we, we've heard a great example of, of Schubert melody. Uh, it, it's interesting that you, you're, spe you're speaking of, uh, of, of, of lenses, of, of cameras. Uh, I, I hear your piece as a, a kind of, uh, of constantly refocusing 
lens, camera lens, on Schubert's melodic style. You, uh, you zoom out sometimes to, to see the big florid gestures of, of melody, like at the beginning and the end of your piece, where you take in a lot of uh, the piano's high-low range, as you mentioned. And then you also zoom in, like an, an extreme close-up, to, uh, to concentrate on single notes, on single uh, monodic lines. And uh, you, you describe the piece to me uh, also as a meditation on voices, as in a Schubert song. And uh, I, I take that to mean single voices and also choirs of voices, which uh, you capture by the, the very resonant pedaling that you call for in the piece. Is that a, a fair approximation? Yes, precisely. Uh, Jacob just sort of read my mind in many ways. And because he has the score, I'm sure he um, intuited that by, by playing this piece. And I, I'm so grateful for those remarks because they're, they're so, as a composer, it's so powerful to hear that. And I think the lens through which I was composing shifted from minute to minute, from hour to hour. And those different elements of a depth to me are so fascinating in Schubert. And whenever I hear Schubert, I, I, my ear has changed so much. I simply want to just take a paintbrush and draw the, what I refer to as the topology of a work. And so I approach this piece similarly. In fact, it was completely, as you know, uninterrupted, this work, from the first note until the very end. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with our collaboration and and right before we heard your elegant performance i was thinking to myself that when we're working together and whenever i'm writing a new piece whether it's it's a new work for orchestra whether it's a new work for solo piano um, or a chamber work my music really is simply about people it, it always has been you know and uh as extensive as program notes can tend to be these days um my expressions remain extraordinarily focused on the artist. And you are uh, the focal point uh, of this particular piece. And so it makes me reflect on all of the Schubert that I've heard. And I trust my intuition uh, because there's so much Schubert in my sound bank. I, I, I can't get it out in so many ways. And I, I hate to put it so coarsely, but the Schubert is always here. It's never not here. Um, does that mean it's immediately transparent on the surface of my music? No, of course not. Um, and it didn't intend to be. However, there is a lens that is in fact affected by that impression. And impressions are so important and perhaps sonic emblems are a better way to sort of technically address that, that question. And um, it leads me to ask you, I just love this train of thought here, um, with regard to the temporality and the arch, the shape of this disc, of your disc. And, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in a time when so much of the sort of sonic mapping occurs from the left side to the right. And when I listen to your disc, I literally start from the first note and I listen to the entire duration so that I can understand this field of scope. Now, this also happens to do a lot. Now I'm tracing back, I'm doubling back and doubling down on something I'd said just a few moments ago, which is that um, I had this incredible experience uh, uh, many years ago. And at the Rothko Chapel, there was this beautiful, absolutely exquisite work, which was enormous. And it was about 80 feet by a hundred or so, which is enormous, right? And it made me question form. It made me understand and ask questions about the interior elements, the structure, the distribution of, of, of density and contextuality, because I think uh, uh, music in general has to be, be understood within contexts. And I remember just spending a few hours, I literally started at one end of, the, of this wall and I just walked and I stood so close. I stood so, I was literally face to face, which I think 
resonates well with tonight's presentation. It's face to face with Schubert. It's face to face with Jacob Greenberg. Um, and so I interpreted when you are going linearly through music, time does not stop. There are these amazing diagonal relationships that are illuminated, right? And so as I'm taking inch by inch, walking against this wall, I'm not aware of any formal constraint. Just as if, if we chose the Fifth Symphony of Schubert, if we did a drop the needle, yes, we could infer by the general feeling and affect of the, of the thematic presentations where we are structurally. But I couldn't tell you that the bar line is in two seconds. And so that has to do a lot with my compositional process, is understanding where my boundaries are and what my elevations, what my topologies consist of. And with Schubert, you're right, there's, there's this intimacy of gesture. And I think for my piece, Chain by Chain, it is governed by these explosive gestures that are, to me, very tender in, in feeling. And interestingly enough, when we were just listening to Schubert, uh, while I was muted, I, I simply couldn't help my hand trying to trace over certain keys that you had articulated. It was just impossible. My anatomy does not allow me not to do that. So now I'm gonna flip the question back on you. Could we talk about the architecture of the disc? Because I know for me, it's so important to see that panoramic perspective and to understand which sonic environment we belong, you know? Um, well, you, you're such a generous listener to, to start at the beginning and, and go through to the end. Uh, I, I do care very much about curation as a principle in my concert programming and in my recordings. Uh, you're familiar with, with some of my solo discs and you know that I think a lot about this. I, I placed your piece at the end of this disc uh, after the two major Schubert pieces because I wanted your piece to be heard as an echo and as an outgrowth also of the principles that Schubert holds dear. And uh, as, as I said, a, a study of, of different ways to view the music from up, from up close and from afar. And more generally as a, a meditation on, on Schubert's piano writing, which, I, uh, which we agree was as adventurous as Beethoven's. Um, yeah, uh, spinning chains of song was uh, the line in, in your program note to the piece and uh, that, that captures it so well. Hey guys, I'm crashing your party. Hi, Suzanne, welcome Hi, back. Hi, um, thank you. Hi, Suzanne. Perfect timing. Um, uh, if folks, this has been a joy. Um, I could certainly go into the wee hours of the morning uh, talking about all things Schubert and certainly all things uh, art and form and structure and all these good things. Um, I would like to take an opportunity to thank Jacob Greenberg for being with us here at Hunter. Uh, it has been such a distinguished pleasure. And also to thank our chair, uh, Professor Suzanne Ch uh, Barron, who has created this incredible opportunity for us to share our work and for us to connect with our students and our audiences when even amid a pandemic and all of the crises that we face, we are here together making music together and we're sharing what we have. And that is why we are stronger together. That is why we can, we can do this. And um, the department has been pioneering in our efforts uh, to solder all of these different pieces of fabric together. And uh, I am so grateful to be here with all of you and uh, for our audience members, please keep tuned for upcoming uh, incredible rosters of performances with the Hunter Symphony, more music talks and tea, among many others, and new composer concerts. Um, with that, I hand this over back to uh, Suzanne, and I would love to begin uh, a Q&A after that. And folks, I would love to also extend an invitation for you to unmute yourselves and join us. Uh, there's nothing better than a real concert um, uh, invitation for a reception. So join us, let's talk music and, and uh, uh, share with one another. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Suzanne. Oh, please, this was a really beautiful evening. I loved, I wrote down so many phrases and one of them is startling intimacy, which I find really stunning and inspiring. And I think we find it in, even in these virtual formats, you know, whenever possible. So folks are 
turning their cameras on, uh, go ahead and unmute. We've got a lot of folks in the Zoom. Go ahead and just ask your questions to David and Jacob. I'll keep an eye on the questions from YouTube Live, uh, but please just go ahead. Uh, I have a anyway, question. Go hi. ahead. Hi, hi. I'm, this is Philip Ewell, Professor I, of Music Phil. Theory. I'm so sorry I came late, but thank you for beautiful <laughs> playing. David, great to see you. Jacob, great to see you. I have a simple question. May I be excused and go home? I'm in my office. <laughs> of course, Phil. It is such a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you and so much, Phil. I see. I have, uh, I'm I looking see, up here because you're on my big screen and this is the computer here. <laughs> I'm sorry well, I came we, in late. I, 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 I wasn't even able to be here right at seven. I came a half an hour late, so... But thank you for this. Thanks, Phil. Phil, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's nice to see the fourth floor, actually the fifth floor, technically yeah. speaking. <laughs> but uh, we are all together here. Phil, thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Great to see Bye. you. Bye. Safe Thanks. travels. Have a good evening. Thank Bye. you, Phil. Um, folks, I welcome. Uh, please unmute yourselves and jump in. And I want to preface this by saying that at the very end, when there are no more questions. Uh, for those of you who know me, I always love to end on a high note, and I always love an encore. I'm going to play some more of Jake's Schubert, um, so please join me in, in that. But let's talk music. Uh, we are open to all things uh, about the presentation this evening and about our collaboration. Composers, please feel, feel free to jump in, ask J Jacob questions, ask myself questions. If you'd like to comment on some of the musical tapestries you've heard this evening, we welcome that. Don't be shy. Yeah. Jacob, I have a question for you. I loved one of the things you said about Schubert, that his that what you heard in his work is uncompromised ideas. And that sounds to me very different from uncompromising. And I'm wondering if you could explain your viewpoint on uncompromised ideas. It felt like a beautiful way of talking about a composer's integrity, but it seemed very specific to Schubert. And I would love to hear more about that. That's a really interesting question. Un uncompromised versus uncompromising. I, well, listening to a line of Schubert's song, you, you can't help but be absorbed by it, uh, really hanging on note to note. And for, for me, it, it's, the fact that the, the music is so deeply rooted in feeling uh, and in, well, you know, one, one always interprets it differently with, with different personal associations. But um, knowing what I know about his, his character and his, his singular devotion to, uh, to song as, as an art form, to, uh, to, to these grand experiments of his large scale pieces, which demand such a quality of, of attention uh, and large forms, which he handles so masterfully um, while experimenting all, all the while. Um, that is uncompromised to me, I think. It's, it's uh, having, having a sense of artistic purpose which is not in the abstract. Um, it, it's, it's always rooted in feeling. It's uh, these pieces which are so hugely varied and uh, in, in, in every, uh, every musical parameter as well. So that, that, that's what invites me into the music personally and, and why I sense that quality in it. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. I, I love the concept of grand experiment. And it's so true. Schubert, f for many, I believe, is synonymous with song. But there is this underlying itch of repetition. And Jacob and I have talked about this almost ad, ad nauseum. Um, I don't believe that there is anything about repetition explicitly in Schubert's music. And it is, uh, vision-wise, it's uncompromised, uh, absolutely uncompromised. 
whether we're talking about a 50 minute structure, the architecture there within is built upon these unique formulations and, and emblems. Um, and so I think for many, uh, including myself, I, uh, we, we love to sing Schubert. And, and for those non-vocalists, I think, I think that's, that's important. Um, the bigger scores, I think I have a few behind me uh, actually right now, um, they are structures that I believe truly were experiments. And we must, as composers, as musicians, as performers, as interpreters, we must take the stage and join in the party of this grand celebration, you know? And one of my promises to Jake and to all of the incredible uh, uh, artists and, and, and uh, orchestras and ensembles I work with is that I will never write the same piece twice. It just can't possibly be. So uh, that resonates with me, what Jacob articulated, simply that every piece is truly an experiment and every experiment must be, must be progressive in a way that you expire your idea, your concept, your vision. And so I remember writing this piece right on this desk as well as that work desk as well. And this is one of the few pieces that I wrote in felt pen. And I never do that because usually there's a few hundreds of hours of editing. I just wrote the double bar because I knew it was over. And then I sent it immediately to Jacob. And then we began the fun work. That's where the collaboration really begins, right? Is, is understanding your collaborator to the extent of providing solutions and also receiving solutions. Composers, I know we talk about this often in forum. We talk about this often conceptually as a device, right? But when we're working with artists on stage and off, it's, it's, it, it, it is reciprocal, right? We, we provide so much and our artist is providing so much. And that spirit in itself is just so admirable and it's so inspirational. Um, you know, having, and also, uh, might I add, it's a little frightening to be on a disc, Schubert, 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 Fulmer. Wow, Schubert. I love Schubert. And my scores are tattered and ripped and marked up to the, the greatest extent. Uh, uh, so there is a heavy weight on my shoulder, but there's also this incredibly carefree, empty, blank slate from which I can just simply draw you a new line. And um, that, was the, that was the most fun. That was the most fun of this piece. Thank you so much. Any other comments or thoughts from the group? Go ahead. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so, so the Thank you, Professor Jeff Nichols of Queen's <laughs> College. I'm not Anne Stone, <laughs> but I'm stealing her computer because it's better than mine. Um, <laughs> I think I recognize the young composer there next to you. Is Aaron. that Aaron Nichols? Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Welcome, Aaron. So, so the way this evening unfolded, it's the reverse of the disc because we heard your piece first, David. And listening to your piece without, um, con without yet knowing how it, the collaboration came about and the context it would have in the disc, it struck me nonetheless as very meditative, reflective, and already like an echo in a way. So it felt that it was, I, I could well imagine, I don't know if I consciously formulated this before you both spoke about the piece, but it, I can feel it in retrospect that, that it felt that it was gesturing toward things that were not fully present as well as being in its own space. So I'm curious, um, what did you know about its position? Did, had, it sounds like Jacob made the decision about where to put it on the desk on the disc after the, he got the piece. But it also sounds like there's something to me, I look forward to hearing the disc in its entirety and experiencing that way. But I can already imagine with these excerpts and having heard your piece, that it's the perfect position for it. So I wonder if you could both talk a little more about the how, what what did you know about the project at the point the piece was begun and and a little more about how it it ended up taking this special place in this program Jeff thank you um, Jeff and Aaron welcome it is so wonderful to have you here uh, in, in in our composer circle here 
uh, it, it's it's interesting. It's it's a it's a question I I thought a lot about as soon as I had the disc in my hand, and I had not given any significant thought um, to order or to the general architectural plan. And Jacob was, of course, uh, the most extraordinary collaborator because I was involved in all of this in real time. And so much I just sort of simply deferred because I do believe that once, once the ink is drying on my manuscript paper, it, it's no longer my piece. It, it's Jacob's piece right now. And, 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 and I have nothing more to say about that piece um, in terms of the notes and rhythms and, and, and articulations. Uh, so I, I, I welcomed that. And I remember even in the editing process, and I, uh, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, um, these were very large, single performance takes uh, from this. And it sounds that, I mean, it's, it's, it's just this gorgeously fluid interpretation. Um, so I, I wasn't uh, concerned necessarily about where uh, I was pivoted between the Schubertian uh, collection uh, of works. I was certainly aware that all things Schubert are all things great. Um, so there, there, there was my own sense of curiosity, and it was wonderful um, to sort of turn away from it for just a moment in production and wait for Jacob to reveal where this contemporary piece, where this piece that was written in the last 9, 10, 12 months uh, was going to emerge. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful uh, now that we began with the uh, with the performance of my piece, and to sort of look telescopically back to 1828. Um, so, uh, Jeff, you've given me a lot to think about. You're you've, you're going to keep me up this evening. I'm going to be thinking about this all night now. Um, that's great, uh, uh, Jacob. I would love your sense of of yeah. Of, um, yeah. No, th th thanks a lot, Jeff. It, it's a great question. Uh, I. I wanted to wait until I received the piece to, to know where it would fit into the programming puzzle. Um, I, I think ultimately any, any choice about ordering, uh, especially between older and newer works, is personal and a little bit arbitrary. But I, I think that points of reference with listening, whatever they might be, have to stay in our consciousness as we move from old to new music or uh, vice versa whether that has to do with musical texture, musical character, mood, harmony, gesture, and any, any number of things. Uh, for instance, I, I have a disc that, that juxtaposes pieces by Debussy with second Viennese school music. And, and my aim with that was to draw attention to the sensual possibilities of both sides of that programming. So uh, I, I, I don't want to prejudge, especially with commissions. I, I, I did want to see what David's piece would be like. Uh, but I, I, I hope that the, the teleological experience of, of listening to this disc is satisfying and a little bit illuminating. I thought it was. And I thought there was something really interesting about imagining David's piece coming at the end after hearing it this way tonight, because there was something, there's something really special I found myself in your work, David, really paying attention to number, which is not something I'm usually really, really sensitive to. I started hearing, and I think it's because I thought that the chain, I was, the the other works and the chain, the idea of chains and spinning, I thought perhaps there were going to be references to Shona Muller in throughout this, which is a song cycle I really love, but uh, there didn't need to be. But I did feel that there was this idea that these things were kind of spinning out and very transparent and you could hear i i might not be remembering correctly but i feel like there were times where you would had six notes one two three four five six one two three four five six change the notes one two three four five six and then one two three four five six seven and that seven seemed to kind of then the water rushes over and the 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 machine starts up again you know the the the, the turning of the mill or the 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 cycle kind of starts again. Were you thinking about weight and you know quantity of pitch in and sort of falling over and then rising? Because I felt there were times when you sort of 
tipped over and the and it and it, we poured out of the sound a little bit and then it rose to these sort of static very few pitches um trans always very transparent but even more transparent when you reduced um the the actual content yeah uh, suzanne thank you for those exquisite observations and uh my gosh, your, your ear picked up everything uh, there. I think what you hit at is absolutely the conceptual process of, of, of what I'm trying um, to, I suppose, uh, illustrate sonically in, in design. And uh, Jacob and I had many uh, discussions about spiraling cycles in Schubert. And for me, instead of cycles, I had spiraling spirals, cycling. And so a cycle is a revolution where a spiral is conical and therefore a spiral never is contiguously adjacent to the same point of origin or departure. Um, and it was a very free, uh, free flowing form. Um, in many ways, and I, I, I was conscious of the different densities, and I love going from very, very sparse textures to extraordinarily uh, aggravated uh, uh, textures that are activating perhaps seven or eight different octaves uh, uh, simultaneously, and then to focus uh, on a, a note or two or on a on a on an intervallic relationship that that I feel is for me sentimental, and I I, I know that. Um, it's become very, very, uh, um, it's become very popular in uh, uh, th these days to 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 write program notes that are just amazingly intricate and extensive. And my program notes for this, when I wrote to Jacob, were actually quite simple. I think I wrote I wrote maybe two or three different uh, two two or three lines, and it had to do with that. Um, so that that was certainly something I was focusing on, mm. and it was completely natural. Uh, um, mm. Because at this, I, I, I rely so much on, on instinct uh, as well as formal devices at play and all of the other intricacies that we composers are, and performers and interpreters mm -hmm. are thinking about. And at the end of the day, whatever template I, I have constructed and or am working on, um, I love to crumple it up and just toss it away. Because at the end, it's the line and the gesture uh, for me that, that is provocative of the interpretal uh, uh, or the interpretational uh, uh, process for Jacob. And so I was, I was so happy to turn over my original manuscripts to him so that he could see mm -hmm. exactly what happened and the solutions with which he provided were perfect. That's great. We have a question coming in from YouTube Live from our own Brian Terry. Hey, Brian. Brian is a Hunter grad and is now uh, uh, studying at McGill University with a fellowship. We're very proud of you, Brian. Um, Brian asks, I was wondering how those different relationships, oh, sorry, I should read the first part. <laughs> Thanks for this awesome discussion. I have a question based on something David said earlier. He mentioned his own relationships with Schubert as a performer, as a conductor, and as a composer, right? Um, I was wondering, Terry, uh, Brian is wondering how those different relationships relate to contrast with and interact with each other when performing or composing. Like, does your composer brain talk to your performing brain about Schubert? Do they teach each other things? The David. That's great. I, I, I love that. It's exactly that. Mm -hmm. And I could simply put a period on it, but mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. I like talking, I'm going to talk a little bit about <laughs> it. But that is exactly as it is. Um, I think uh, I cannot disassociate my hand with any other part of my anatomy. Uh, and, and, and it's very hard, even when we were listening to Jacob Schubert, uh, I, I, I needed to sculpt something. I, I, my, my instrument here, my instruments needed to do something in order to compensate for that musical data, for that information that came into me. Mm -hmm. So when I'm writing, uh, of course, uh, uh, these scores, I, 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 can't, I can't throw them out the window. Um, so they are always with me. But what I can do is be true to my design. And at the end, uh, I, I'm always striving for originality and authenticity so that 
I can give that to my performer. And as a conductor, when I'm on the podium and off, um, no two beats are the same. And I say this with every orchestra I work with, um, especially the Hunter Symphony. Uh, so there are no two congruent beats, whether we are playing Brandenburg III mm -hmm. or, or a brand new work where the ink is still wet on the page. Mm -hmm. um, so that does have to do with uh, my, uh, my form and aesthetic, uh, simply that I, I love the consistency of inconsistency. Mm -hmm. Texture. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to add, Dave. Yeah. Uh, in um, I realized in commissioning you that that it really is unique that you're a composer performer who performs standard repertoire as well yes. as contemporary music. There actually yes. aren't too many of those. Yes. And I yes. I knew that it would be a strength in in this project as you brought your your associations and and your understanding of of Schubert to the project. Well, you both have so much depth to to your your artistry. Your musicianship just speaks so profoundly to all of us. I am so grateful for this conversation, and I'll just ask if there's any last thoughts that anybody in the Zoom or yes, Alyssa, go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi. Um, so I have a question for Professor Fulmer. Um, so I know we talked about. Um, being inspired by um, other composers and from other time periods. And something that I'm struggling with when I uh, write a piece and I base it off of a com another composer is to, you know, this, this fine line between um, inspiration and almost copying. So I know that's not what you did, but how did you get to that essence of Schubert and then made it into your own language? I, I love the question. It, it, I think it, it's something I'm pretty, I, I can say with certainty, there's not too many things I can say with certainty, but this, every musician feels that question. Every composer, every performer, every single utterance of an artistic vision or approach questions that. And, and it, it, it's so interesting to me. I, I, I have this compulsively obsessive addiction to music, I, I over there. There's a few dozen iPods, and and so I'm listening to music anywhere for between eight and nine hours a day. And when I look at the the counts, you know, I'm listening to the Beethoven Cavatina, you know, four thousand two hundred eighty-one times. I listen to, uh, I I listen to Jacob Schubert somewhere around six hundred twenty times or so. Um, but by utilizing that exercise, I have saturated my sound bank in such a way that I can so comprehensively. Uh, um, uh, enjoy and, and love and cherish it, but also I can turn that sort of 90 degrees. I, 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 can, I can allow that work to project in a different shape. And so when I'm, when I'm listening to Schubert, I know that I can't possibly write Schubert. I could never finish the Unfinished Symphony. I could never write, an, uh, write another song off of, off of or, 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 or any other song cycle, right? It would, it would simply be impossible because I don't breathe the air that Schubert did. I, can't, I, I don't wear the same clothing. I don't eat the same foods. Uh, it is so inextricably tied to form and structure of, of, of artistry and, and, and sort of what we, do to, uh, what we do from day to day, how we interact with artists. Um, so to, to, I think um, to answer it quickly, I would say that uh, I am infatuated with what I am listening and, and analyzing, whether it is from a theoretical perspective and or a historical perspective, or just as a, as a music enthusiast. Um, on the other hand, I know that it is my job that when I, when I come to my composing sanctuary, I must create a vision for my work to live. And a lot of this, I know that we've discussed this, uh, composers, I know that we've discussed this when we're talking about instrumentation and uh, creating a new work, whether it's for or a symphony at a, a orchestra or a full symphony orchestra or mixed ensemble, throwing in instruments is much like cooking, right? Uh, it's much like the culinary arts. You see what sort of sticks and what works. Um, so I try not to allow very specific emblems of Schubert to get into my hand because I could never write like Schubert. And uh, 
I expect that of, of every composer. I, 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 and, and I genuinely believe every composer tries to compartmentalize or partition themselves away from a specific influence. And, and I want to make it clear, I love influence. I love when things are influenced. There's nothing better to me than something that is ornamented and elaborate. I just, I, I love elaboration in my music and in any music. And uh, even to the extent of when I play um, music of the Baroque, um, you know, I'm often told, oh, we don't need any more ornaments over there. It's just, it's too, it's too, it's too thick. Yeah. Um, so I think when you're working with a piece of art, and you're drawing inspiration, whether it's from, a, it, it, it could be a canvas that's hanging in MoMA right now across the street. It could be at the Met um, on 84th Street. Uh, whatever art you choose to gather energy, that sort of, that, that artistic energy from it, you are a filter. And so therefore, I want to hear the composer. I don't want to hear the art from which that composition and or art originated from. And it's hard. I, I understand. It's so hard, especially with music, because we as musicians, uh, those, those particular sonic stamps, as I like to put them, they are ingrained. I do believe they are in our cell structure. I do believe that. It is, it is nucleic, right? Certain emblem, emblem, uh, emblems that we hear, uh, they are untransformable. They, they, are, they are immutable. They're they are absolutely without transpositional defense, yeah? So uh, whatever art uh, that you are striving towards and gathering energy from, gather the energy and make it yours because that's what we want to hear and that's what we want to see. If, if I can join in, I wanted to offer as well that there, there's always some point of intersection between past and present of, of music and, and those points are always individual. So if you're looking to, to start a piece uh, with direct inspiration from a, a single work or a genre of works, you can self-examine and, and ask, what is the intersection? How do you identify with it? What particular element of the music uh, from melody to harmonic sense really speaks to you? And, and go from there. So it, it's a little bit of, of analysis that, that comes before but uh, just know what appeals to you and how you can take it. In your uh, yeah, I, 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 I absolutely love that. And to be honest, if I were to grab a blank slate of composition paper right now, and I wrote the similarities between chain by chain and all of the Schubert repertoire, there are more similarities than there are dissimilar traits, right? So from a, a, a purely uh, functional pers perspective, we can identify that. In fact, uh, Jacob and I were at many times as part of this project discussing the technical capacities of the instrument and what Schubert did in 1828 and what I did in 2020 and to, in, in 2019 and, and so forth. So mm -hmm. um, I think there is absolutely an intersection and we are the intersecting pivots. We are those moments mm -hmm. from which the art and gesture explodes, right? That, that, that is what we as artists do. I think I'm going to have to function as an intersecting pivot right now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jacob and David. Thank you, Jake Sachs Michelini. Thank you, Brad Stoller. Thank you, Malika Holder. Thanks to all the composers. By the way, that's our team, our online production team. And aren't they great? Because this just went so smoothly. Thanks. Um, so nice to see all your faces. Thanks to everyone who joined on YouTube Live. It's wonderful to get to share art and thought together, even at a distance. And I was shocked and warmed by the startling intimacy of this evening. Thank you all. Let's see each other again at another Music Talk and Tea. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. You want to play some music for us to leave to, David? I would love to. Great.